There's so much to talk about when you're thinking about improving Epcot. I spent almost two hours last week in part one, and all I talked about was Future World West, Spaceship Earth, and a little bit more. This week, Future World East, Guardians of the Galaxy, Test Track, World Showcase, Anna and Elsa, so much more. You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Tomorrow Society podcast, episode 111. I am your host, Dan Heaton, and I'm excited to talk more about Epcot. It was a lot of fun to dig into my thoughts and then also talk about your ideas last week, where I focused on Spaceship Earth, Epcot on the whole, and Future World West, which included the Seas Pavilion, the land, and imagination. I quickly realized when recording that that it was not going to be just one episode, but I promise everything will be concluded this week, and I have some really cool interviews coming up in the upcoming weeks. This time, I'm going to start over in Future World East, looking at Guardians of the Galaxy, Mission Space, the Play Pavilion, Test Track, that area and what I would like to see there, and then go to World Showcase, where I can talk a bit about the current attractions that are there, like Frozen Ever After, Three Caballeros, and of course, Ratatouille, and then some of my ideas. The focus of this is for my ideas on changes I would make to improve Epcot. When I say improve, you can easily look at that as me saying somehow it's broken or it needs to be completely fixed. This is my personal preference. There are a lot of things that I still love in Epcot. I mentioned last week that it's been my favorite park for so long. Right now, I'm not 100% sure, just given on my enjoyment and what I've focused on in our recent trips. We always go to Epcot, and there's things I love, but I think there are ways Disney could make it better. And again, I am looking at this not in terms of what's happening right now with the pandemic. This is a fun exercise. It came up on episode 100. The idea is in a normal-ish world where Disney has resources and revenues in order to make changes to their parks, what should they do? What should they focus it on? And I'm coming at this, again, as the perspective of a fan of Epcot Center, but I'm trying to keep an open mind and not just talk about bringing in a bunch of old things at the expense of new things. There's a mix. There's things I love that are recent and older things. So it'll be a mix and I hope you enjoy it. And at the end, I'm going to, again, talk about more of your ideas, play a few audio clips that were sent to me. A lot of great stuff that I was not able to play last week that fits more this week. So I hope you enjoy this show and I don't want to take any more time because there's a lot to cover so let's dive in to part two of Improving Epcot. Let's start by turning left when we walk into Epcot. And of course, that is the former site of the Universe of Energy. And like I mentioned last week, I am taking this as basically where we are right now. So we are still technically in a situation where Disney has Future World and World Showcase, not any neighborhood. So I'm not going to start calling this area in Future World East World Discovery. I'm going to keep it as just Future World. So, but Universe of Energy, Ellen's Energy Adventure has been closed for more than several years. So I am not able to salvage that. We've already removed the materials. And we've spent a lot of money on Guardians of the Galaxy. And so my thought is, we're not going to stop that project. It's going to be there. However, I am going to make assumptions that Disney is not doing everything maybe they could to make this experience fit with the spirit and just the unity of 
my Epcot that I'm creating or changing here. So we're still going to have the roller coaster that is called Cosmic Rewind that starts with the backwards launch, has I believe is a spinning coaster from what I've heard, and obviously the massive building. First step, I am going to make sure that this building is hidden better. So right now, the way things are looking, and again, talk to me in two years, maybe Disney will have it so well hidden that I'll be like, it looks great. But I feel like we really need to make an effort, given this show building, whether it's through just a really amazing set decoration or even putting you know, trees. Again, Xandar, I don't believe, has a lot of trees, but there needs to be a concerted effort to make the sight lines better. No, you cannot completely hide this massive building, but there has to be a way for Disney to either make this look so impressive where it could stand alongside areas like Spaceship Earth, kind of how the Matterhorn, you know, and Sleeping Beauty Castle, the Matterhorn's much bigger, but you can still have both at Disneyland. And so here's a situation where in Future World, this building cannot look anywhere near like it does right now. Adding Go Away Green is not going to be enough. You need to really work on this looking, and I'm not talking about looking gaudy or overly crazy, just fitting within the area. And I don't have a huge confidence right now that Disney is doing that. So first, we're focusing on the outside. Second, in a similar vein, we need to make sure that this area flows well with the areas around it. So you have a situation where, again, kind of what I was getting at with the entrance, making it such an inviting area where this is not some sort of thing where you're at Spaceship Earth. Okay, I'm at Spaceship Earth. I'm doing this. And then I go over and it's like, dur, 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 and the Guardians of the Galaxy music is playing. And like, no, no, we can't do that. We have to respect. We have to have fun with it. Where Guardians is fun characters, fun movies. I love the first Guardians of the Galaxy. The second one's okay. But basically... We need to make this come together in some way. Now, some of you later are going to have some ideas of kind of how to section that area that I'll talk about. But really, it just there needs to be the best design tools to make everything look as fitting as it can design. Well, I trust Disney has the people there that we can do this, but you just have to find a way to not just accept the fact that, oh, well, we're going to have characters. We need them. This is going to look weird. No, let's let's make this its own area. And whether you have to create massive entrances that go through and they did a good job at Hollywood Studios with setting us into Galaxy's Edge where that transition feels kind of nice. But it still feels weird to get out of Galaxy's Edge. And a minute later, you're in Toy Story Land. It's like, what? Now, that's Hollywood Studios. It's a different setup. But Epcot, I feel like the bar needs to be a little higher. And so my focus really beyond that is going to be on the queue areas and with the story. And it could be a case where the story is great now and really fits. But how do we find a way without just saying, hey, Peter Quill visited Epcot when he was a kid? Oh, boy. The less said about that, the better, which they haven't said much. Essentially, I want this to fit in the best way it can, given that we have the Guardians of the Galaxy, whether you're putting in some sort of time travel theme and the pre-show areas really need to have a to feel like I'd actually love it if they felt more like older Epcot Center. It's like and not just in a fan servicey way really in a way where you come in and there's nods to other attractions or connections there where in a sense you have the guardians of the galaxy, these characters kind of coming somehow merging in a weird way. Maybe you have something where, you know, there's Xandar and there's a, (laughs) I was going to laugh like a, I just watched Thor recently, like a wormhole bridge, the rainbow bridge, no, something that connects that to Epcot. There's a lot of inventive ways you can do this and make it super fun. So what I want to come in, I don't want to come in and be thinking, this doesn't fit. What are they doing? Oh my gosh. I want to come in and be thinking, I'm tr- like I mentioned with Pandora, hey, they surprised me. They did better than I expected. There's a way that through the multiple pre-show rooms, that by the time I get on the ride, I'm totally on board. I suspect the ride is going to be great. This is a reason, too, that I have to be a little more realistic, where you have a situation where an attraction, 
like Ellen's Energy Adventure, for example, may not have been drawing as many people. It's not something that people are going to go to the park for. That doesn't mean it's a bad attraction. I think attractions like that are essential and they it ate up a ton of people. It was a long attraction. When you replace it with a short roller coaster, it might not be the same. But if you really make the pre-show experiences something special and the story build up and then the coaster is almost like part two of it or something that's where it could really fit well and i really hope they i know they've done a lot of this with interesting ways to make cues kind of be part of the attraction like rise of the resistance i don't expect this to be like that but even in smugglers run there's a lot in the queue that sets me up by the time i get into the falcon i've already experienced a lot of cool things so something like that using those types of skills could make it be great and before i continue though i did want to talk a little bit more about characters in epcot in general I'm going to get to that more later when I get to your comments, but just right away, all things equal, I would love for Disney to only have original characters at Epcot. However, I understand the nature of the theme park business and how IPs, the impact that Harry Potter has had at Universal in making Drawing so much to them, what Nintendo may bring eventually when they open Epic Universe, that's going to have a lot of properties. So theme park guests are interested in characters. So this is a case where I think I've gotten a little bit softer on this, where yes, I do not want characters in Spatial Birth. I don't want, I don't like the way that Nemo is in the seas, for example. I think the land is doing just great without any characters, test track, etc. But here, now that the decision has been made, let's think of it in terms of what is the best way we can incorporate the characters in Guardians of the Galaxy into my future world. Because in world discovery, so oh, there's more flexibility. We, you know, it's just about discovery and the Guardians of the Galaxy is discovering things, yes. But looking at it right now, the way it is, I think, okay, let's put them there. But just the fact that I say, okay, I will work with them there, and I recognize the importance there, does not mean that I think we should just start bringing in, like, have this massive Marvel area or bring in Star Wars or whatever. The biggest reason for this for me, too, is not just because, oh, I want Epcot Center to be like it was in the 80s or 90s. No. I want the parks to each be their own thing. I would love to see more and more and more different characters and franchise and everything in Disney's Hollywood Studios the way it's set up right now. I think there are effective ways to bring characters into any Disney park, but I don't want all the parks to kind of just flow together. I want it to be a situation where it feels like the right fit. I was hoping when Disney hadn't announced yet what they were doing, that they could find a way to put Guardians of the Galaxy in for Rock and Roller Coaster. Not because I disliked that so much. I mean, Aerosmith has, you know, they're a bit long in the tooth, if you will. But I like Rock and Roller Coaster. I think it's cool. But if Disney really was trying to find a way to put Guardians at Walt Disney World, I felt like that would fit better. But now that you know they have spent all this time and resources and money, I think, okay, what changes and what can they do in the next year or however long it takes to finish it to make this the best experience possible that fits within the park and also that pleases fans of Marvel, that pleases guests that don't know about Marvel, and that just is a cool area because not everyone's going to want to ride the roller coaster. What can you do in that area to make it an inviting space that has some unity with how the entire park is set up. And I don't know how that's going to be. That's just if I was someone who had control and was trying to give directives to designers, imagineers, everyone about what to do to, oh, we got a little bit of time now. We're going to be delayed. What can we do conceptually? That is how I would look at it. And I think, I know I'm being a little vague here. It's just because unlike something like Spaceship Birth, we don't actually have the attraction yet. I want to give them a little benefit of the doubt which might not be warranted, but at least to see what it is, see how cool it is, and then be like, okay, this works, this doesn't, this does. But I know that I would really work for them to try and do what they can with the show building and make the pre-shows deliver a complete story and really build this up into the super headliner that goes beyond the Guardians. Because there's always a fact like, well, what if in 10, 15, 20 years, Guardians of the Galaxy will probably still be known, but let's say they're not. Will this attraction work? And that's where I'm talking about things that maybe are beyond just the characters in the pre-shows and the setup. 
what could they do to make this work? And I know there's a chance they could swap out the effects in the attraction because it's screens, it's not audio electronics. But still, let's make this work for the long term, not the short term. Let's step over now to Mission Space, which <laughs> this spot, of course, was the original home of Horizons, which was in place from 1983 to 1999. And has been Mission Space for quite a long time now, given when it opened pretty much about the same time, which is kind of crazy to think about the more I think about it. And so many of us look at Horizons as the gold standard of extinct attractions. Some of us, including me, would say it's their favorite attraction of all time. Now, part of that, of course, is the fact that Horizons hasn't been in place for more than 20 years. So if it continued the whole time, who knows what we would say about it. I think we would still enjoy it. I would hope there would have been some updates. But I don't want to keep talking for a long time about Horizons, but I think it's important to recognize that because there's a lot of mentions and responses I've gotten and everything about what Disney should do. And I'm going to talk a bit more about it in a little bit. But I do think that Mission Space could not really win with a lot of fans that were into Horizons. Now, granted, there are plenty of people that go to Disney World that never have been on Horizons, that don't know what it was, and so Mission Space's popularity or a lack thereof, in some cases, is totally unrelated to that, and that's mostly the case. Now, here's the thing for me. I really am interested in the space program. I've read a lot of books, especially about Apollo, Probably one of my favorite books of all time is A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin, which does such a good job of going through the astronauts and telling this fun, compelling story about their lives and the missions themselves. A space attraction should be so much up my alley. This should be basically one of my favorite attractions in the world. Instead, I released my rankings of Epcot attractions. Mission Space was not last. There's a lot worse, but it was right basically in the middle. So, and I think that's how I feel about the attraction. I think it's fine. I try to go on them over there. If I don't make it, it's not a big deal. I usually now don't do the spinning version. I did it a few times, kind of felt a little woozy afterwards, decided, yeah, I don't really need to do that over and over. So if we do it, it's the green version and still fun, but obviously when you throw the pull out the thrills, there's not as much to it. It's you're kind of sitting there kind of squished in looking at a screen, but still I appreciate there are, even though it was designed to connect with the movie Mission to Mars, the movie didn't do well. You know, you could see the connections, but it's not really an IP based attraction. I appreciate that and that it stayed that way. I like that Disney did put in some effort to make two unique experiences by putting in the Earth version for the green. So it's not like you're just doing the same thing twice and just one of them doesn't spin. They're different versions. I like that they brought in Gina Torres from Firefly and so many other things into the mix. Sorry, Gary Sinise. Those are things I like. However, I do think there are ways to improve it. One, it needs to be more interactive. Right now, they do have a situation where you have your position that you get to choose, or you're not really choose, you're chosen for, and then you get to press a button, or you know, in the end, you get to use the um, joystick. That's nice, but that's a very limited amount of things. What you do doesn't really impact it. It does cause things to happen at a slightly different time, but if you don't do it, the manual override happens. So I would like to see Disney work to create experiences that, are, one, it's more customized. Different things happen each time. I mean, they could do it with Star Tours. The adventure continues. There should be a way to do it here. You don't even have to worry about all the different characters. So make things varied up. At least have multiple versions. Different things can happen. It can come together. That's one. Two, we should be able to, this may not be the case we're up to the level of Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run because it wasn't designed that way. But some way where we're heading in that direction where, yes, we all still have our roles and we can do various things, but the things we do should have some impact on what we see and how it works. Now, I suspect what I'm describing is a lot more technologically advanced than we might think. There's just a lot to it. However, 
that would be the goal for me. The rewritability needs to be much higher. It also just needs to be more fun. Even the way the pre-show goes and everything, it's so serious. And it's funny because you know, I look back towards early Epcot and a lot of the ideas, that was more serious. But let's have some fun. This is supposed to be this adventure of a lifetime. Another thing, too, is let's make it like you're actually really going to space. And I know you could say, well, that, that actually pulls away from the reality. and That's the way Epcot approaches. But, you know, why not? Why not have a situation where we actually are going? Now, granted, if you go to Mars... When you come out, you're like, wait, I'm not in Mars. Okay, there is a suspension of disbelief that when you actually get to the post-show. But really, if you want to push it even further, create a post-show area that seems like it's Mars. I know then you say, well, what if we're going to Earth? Okay, there are some issues to work out here. Along with making it a more customized experience, bring the technology up. The visuals don't look as impressive as I think they should, even given the recent updates. And just... Use the ride vehicles you have, use the basic structure, but make it something that really stands out and that people really want to go on over and over to find all the different things and the various approaches and different places you can go. Even Smuggler's Run needs a lot more that you can do, especially different experiences. So I don't want to paint that as the perfect example. So do that. Make it more customizable. You know, still have the spinning version for people that want to take some thrills. But just they need that the whole like pre-show area and the way it's described has some nice areas, but also just needs a bit of a refresh. It needs to feel a little nicer, especially in that first room when you come in. It's a little loud and kind of, I don't know, everything just needs a bit more something. And I think that that also goes to the post-show area where let's let make this feel more like a grand experience. The components are all there. I feel like the basic core setup is in place for mission space to be a top five attraction at epcot if not higher in overall walt disney world i don't think disney's going to focus too much on it but if i was in charge i would definitely look at mission space and say what can we do to really make it something special rather than kind of to the point where okay the whole draw was the thrills we made some tweaks to make it a little better but that's still the big draw and I feel like there's a ceiling to the way it's set up now that could easily be passed if we made some updates and just added a little magic to it. And I mean magic in just theme park design and making us connect more with the experience rather than feeling like we're a little bit at a distance from it, which is how I feel now. I don't get the same impression doing this that I have doing the original Soren or Flight of Passage or even on Smuggler's Run where you feel like you're really involved in something and you kind of can easily just kind of go for that ride. And I want to have that same experience on Mission Space, and I just don't really have it right now. So I'm going to skip over the Play Pavilion and all my thoughts there and what I'm going to do and move on to Test Track, because Test Track is kind of a similar situation than Mission Space. I think Test Track is further along in where I want it to be than Mission Space. I like it more than maybe some people do, especially version 2.0. Because if I look back at the first version, what I really liked about that was the tongue-in-cheek humor of it, where you had these thrills, but it was also kind of never taken that seriously. Aided largely by John Michael Higgins, who's been in the Christopher Guest movies and Arrested Development and so many other things. His voice was really perfect for that and really setting the right tone. But I really like version 2.0. I think the music is so much better from Paul Leonard Morgan. I think that the effects inside look really cool and fit well in Future World. It's interesting to me that Test Track now fits better in the Future World that I want to see than the original version did. And a lot of that has to do with the music and the effects. Both of those, to me, fit very comfortably in any era of Future World, including the one right now. And having the thrills is a good draw. Like I mentioned with Guardians of the Galaxy, I want to have a wide range of ride systems. I'm not saying we should go back to Omnimovers across the board. We need to have thrill rides. We need to have various types of vehicles. That also fits with the idea of the future, where you're going to have a lot of different ways you can travel and different transportation options, including cars, including futuristic cars. So that's a good thing. What I would do with Test Track, there's a few different things. One, of course, we just need to make sure that everything's working properly, that 
the setup is there because it's easy with an attraction like this that just requires so much maintenance and so much upkeep that it might not get that way, but that's a little boring. So I want to get to what I think needs to change. I think the designing the cars is a fun element. My girls love it. And seeing it from their perspective, I think a lot of people like being able to do that in the pre-show where you're able to kind of create your own thing and you could easily imagine to yourself that you're writing it. When you're actually in the attraction, however, I feel like it's a bit limiting. I think there needs to be a way to make what you design better explained how it works. Putting us in different order, half the time that doesn't even work. And when it does, there needs to be some way. And I don't expect that it's going, because there's six people and you're all doing your own vehicles, you can't really have a situation where what you design really has an impact on your ride experience. It would just be a matter of updating this in order to maybe it's even just making sure it all works and adding more elements, but there needs to be some way to make it connect with us further. So that's one thing. I think it doesn't have to be a huge change, but we need to find a way to make what you're doing with designing the car feel like it matters more. And that's something that I would say, we let's bring in the brightest minds and find a way to slightly tweak it where it becomes more of a competition, but also you're able to really see the results of what you did. And maybe it's as simple as when you get all finished, that you're able to get a report that really describes what you did a certain way and what you didn't do, or even, you know, um, some sort of point system where how well you do, there's high scores for the day. I mean, there's just some different approaches you could take to make it more interactive and make you feel like you're really designing something special. Um, maybe give out prizes to the highest people that do the best. It would create kind of buzz on the internet where everyone kind of like now where people are trying to find how you get the most points on Toy Story Mania or Buzz Lightyear. How do you do the best on test track? And then, but don't make it too easy. Make it where it's super complicated. And another thing I think would be great. Again, you've got uh, an attraction with the visual effects inside. Mix things up mix up what happens, and even if we really want to spend a bit more money, send cars in different directions. I don't know if that's even possible inside this tight space. I remember for a while when you would get up to that, you know, track A, it took a few rides where I'd be like, wait, there's only one way I can go here. And granted, you all have to end in the same place, but is there anything that can be done to mix up the ride experience, whether you see different effects or maybe one time you're supposed to do a brake run and it goes slower or faster or starts at a, just some customizability with Test Track because I feel like it's basically there. I've never really gotten the idea that, oh, you just stick your head out of your car on the highway and it's the same thing. To me, it's not. To me, the experience of actually being in that ride vehicle in the middle of Epcot, getting outside and going so fast, it's a thrilling moment. And I think it's it's kind of like a roller coaster, but it's different. Also, just coming out of the whole dark ride experience. So most of the changes I would make, I would stress in two areas. One is to make it more interactive. And two, again, this is kind of very similar to what I was saying about Mission Space. Allow the experience to be more customized. And I know it's easy for me to sit here and say, hey, just program it differently or whatever. But I think this is the wave of the future at theme parks. It really needs to be an experience that people want to come back to. And you're not going to be able to set up virtual reality and everything and all that. But there have to be ways that the experience, one, you have more of a role, and two, that it's different. And I think going to the point, this does not mean that on every ride we should have guns and we're firing at targets. To me, that's lazy interactivity. Granted, I enjoy doing that. That's fun. I, I like firing at guns and getting points. But there have to be various different ways you can do it that are still part of the ride experience. I don't want to spend my whole day doing Sorcerers of the Magic Kingdom or something like that or getting out my phone and pointing it at objects. I want it to be part of the attractions I already love without it being jarring where if someone doesn't want to be as involved, that's okay. you know. And so that kind of carries over into the post-show area where I would like, I focus about across the board, I would like the post-show to have more connections to forward-thinking technology in terms of what's happening in the auto industry, especially with self-driving cars. Even if Disney really wanted to go further, you could find an area kind of in that parking lot section for a demonstration of self-driving cars. But at a minimum, things like that, 
the latest advances in electric cars and ultimately in self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, put that in the post show where then you come out and you're like, wow, this is incredible. I didn't know about this. It could be as simple as a film. It, you put the car in there. Just a lot of things where, one, it's more updated. You're working with industry or with thinkers. But two, it also, people come out of there and they're like, yes, I had a fun experience on Test Track. That was fun. But beyond that, I come out of it going, I did not know about X. Or And it can only be you spend 5, 10, 15 minutes in there, maybe a half hour. It doesn't have to be something super dry or boring. But again, it's another way in a post show to kind of reflect on that idea that I was talking about with Communicore and Inventions, all that. But you do it individually to each subject matter. You keep it. You could even have a special event there, like I talked about, that people could come to. Everything you're doing here is to make Epcot feel like it's evolving and feel like that it's modern and on the cutting edge of it. It almost establishes the future world name. If Epcot is on the cutting edge in terms of these various different realms, whether it's with marine life, plant life, films, even in the theater, the Magic Guy Theater and transportation and space, which I hadn't even mentioned too, but there could be a way to connect mission space that way. All these different areas that still are so important to STEM and everything moving forward. And you do this in a fun way where you're still, you could go and enjoy fun attractions for your whole day. And that is great. However, I think in our post-COVID world, I don't know if that's even the right word, in our world going forward, for people to go to themed experiences and to go to parks as regularly or even close to as before, I think the bar is going to be raised and you it's not going to be enough to just bring in big characters and intellectual property. You're going to have to do that and also promise something unique and something ever-changing. And Epcot is the perfect park to do that, to evolve and to continue to evolve in the future. Now let's circle back, turn around from Test Track, and look at the former Wonders of Life Pavilion, which will be known as the Play Pavilion in the future. No, no, it will not. I don't hate the idea of the Play Pavilion, looking at how Disney has been operating Epcot. I think the idea of putting a lot of cool, different activities, character rings, everything in one place is fine. However, this is the spot that I'm going to do my most expensive update in Future World. Second was probably the imagination changes, but this is even more extensive. And this is definitely the, oh, obvious Epcot Center thing. But I have to do it. I want to talk about it. This is my thing. This is my show. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about it. And I'm going to change the Play Pavilion. And we're going to call this Pavilion New Horizons. It's a little obvious, but it also fits with the song. It's not just like New Fantasy Land where you pick the old thing and you, you know, it fits with the song. And we are going to create a pavilion that is not the same as Horizons. In fact, part of it is going to have hands on activities, various things that you could do, like the Play Pavilion. However, the main focus of this is going to be a new dark ride that maintains the spirit and general idea of Horizons, but looks forward from now to further into this century. This is a case, again, where my idea of looking towards the past, but then bridging it to the future really hits home. Because basically, there are parts of Horizons that I would like to include. I would like to have a general structure that might be similar, but we are not just going to recreate the attraction. This is not a case. I'm not following the idea, which you sometimes see when people say, what should Disney do? Bring back Horizons, bring back everything. It was great forever ago. No, this is going to be a situation where we have elements of it, certain parts. And again, we could even, it's a dark ride. We're facing out. I'm going to say the first thing that I definitely want to include is some sort of omnisphere like approach. Now, granted, given what we've seen with Flight of Passage and others, the quality of this has gone much higher. See, that's the interesting thing I like about this is you can have slow moving dark ride portions, but you can also have more thrills here. So you when you get to that point, which is still going to be at the midpoint of the attraction, 
you're showing new technologies and everything, but you're also making it more exciting. You are you can show outer space and the International Space Station and what we're planning to do there. Or, you know, what we're doing right now, because, of course, that's the present time, science, undersea, everything that we are doing, that can be just spectacular. And the great part about that is it's only part of the attraction. That's just a few minutes. So you have that as the midpoint. And then the early part is kind of looking back, looking towards the future. But again, we're looking at it from our perspective now. So we can have references to Jules Verne, but it's not just looking back then. We're updating this for our perspective now. So you can have things from the 1980s and how it looked at the future and what we thought it was going to be or, you know, cartoons and movies and everything not just Disney movies. I'm not talking just about characters, but update that, but have that similar feel that it's fun and you have narrators and everything. And then you go through this spectacular, thrilling several minute sequence in the middle. And then of course you have a dark ride portion after that with animatronics. But again, we don't just want to have the same family. I would like to update it to include how many families are now and to have a culturally diverse and just take it to the next level and say, here's where families are now. So you're still having that connection, but you're not going to look at it and go, oh, of course, it's just like the family from Carousel Progress. No, we have elements about that, but we're going to show all different types of families and how they will interact in the future and really stress the fact that this world is not just one way. So you can have same-sex couples and and single parents, and and interracial couples. And, and again, I'm not trying to lose the point. My point is that this world can be an inspiring place if we all work together and look to the future for tomorrow's horizons, you know, new horizons, the whole deal. If you can dream it, you can do it. But we all need to be in this. It's essentially, in a way, even my ideas have changed more given where we are with COVID-19 and how all of us are at home and just where the culture is right now and everything being so divisive, I want this attraction to showcase the best of not just the way the United States is, but the way the world is. So we're talking about technologies in the future, space, undersea, the desert, things we're doing, things we can be doing in the future, like Horizons did, with music, with animatronics, with impressive sets, the whole deal. But this message, to me, is slightly different than even it was in 1983. This is a message of inclusion, of diversity, of so much of what is, in a way, being pushed back on from certain parties. I would like Disney to focus on, and again, this is kind of what I talked about at the very start of last week's podcast about Epcot, is that I don't look at, my vision for Epcot is not as an elitist place, not as a we're smart, you're not kind of place. It's a place that all of us can enjoy, which is why when I'm doing an attraction like this, I want it to reflect what's really going on in our society, and I will get more to that in World Showcase a bit. But also the idea that there are ways that our technology, as we've seen even with things like right now, like Zoom or even the way the internet is and the way we can all still connect while being, di being distanced, our technology can find ways to connect us as we strive to move forward and explore and live in different ways. And my idea for New Horizons is to do that. Yes, there are connections. There'll be a lot of fun callbacks to the original version and similar music in certain places, but that it's going to be a modernized version. So then of course you get to the end and again, we're able to choose which way we want to go, but it's going to be a lot more. It, you still get to choose between space, sea or desert, but we're going to choose that. And then it's going to be a varied experience. It's going to be customized. Yes. We're going to make a few choices. It's not going to be like space or birth where you answer a bunch of questions. No, we choose which way we want to go. And then a lot of different things can happen. It's still a short minute or two at the end. It's not going to seem that different. I like the idea of the individualized screen. I don't want us to just get too far away from that, but use new technology we're thankfully we're able to do a lot of things with CG where we don't have to create all the models, you know, given just how expensive that was. But you're able to have this personalized experience that isn't the same every time. So granted, I'm talking about 
this old attraction that many of us love, but that is being used as a template, as a model for something even more impressive, something that can stand the test of time, something that has multiple experiences where it's a bit more thrilling, um, modernized with technology, and still has elements that made Epcot Center so great. I mean, attraction theme songs, I love them. The ride system, I like that ride system up against the wall where you can look out and see everything. You're not constantly turning back and forth. There's a lot of good elements from the original, and then just you're expanding on that and making this into something that represents the best in themed entertainment that Disney can do. So this is there's some fan service to this, but then there is also service of the modern guest. You need to make sure this is fun. It's not clunky. That um, it doesn't try too hard too to reflect what's going on in this exact moment. So it doesn't seem like the final scene of Carousel of Progress. That it reflects something we're looking towards and things that are possible, but an approach that. Maybe we didn't even realize was that close. And that's where it's going to take some real skill involved. But I think it's possible. And I would love to see Disney or another company in the theme park industry really take a shot at something on this scale. They've shown what they can do. Look at what they did with Pirates of the Caribbean in Shanghai and the level of skill and mix of sets and screens and everything for what's essentially a fun jaunt adventure, a fun adventure that we all can take on a boat ride. Why not use some of those skills to make something that is fun, feels like you're going on a journey, but is a little bit different? Why not do that? I think it could be really fun. This is, again, the most out of the box I'm going to go, the least likely to ever happen. But I do think about in terms of Disney putting a big emphasis on including New Horizons and Epcot Forever. And from what I've heard, that a lot of people that work at Disney do love this attraction. Now, granted, this is not as I don't see the current leadership ever doing anything like this. But hey, they're not the leaders on this podcast. It's me. So I look at this and think, wow, this could be something truly amazing. And this is a case where I would love to dig a lot further into this, but I, I you know, require research and really digging into what I want to do. If this is something you would find interesting, I could even do a whole episode probably on my ideas here, but likely it would take a lot more prep work. And this may be a case where I'm kind of slimming down the target audience for this show even more than it already is when you're doing almost two hours like last week on Improving Epcot. But I think this would be fun to ride fun to design and still could be done in a way that guests would enjoy. Like you think of things like flight of passage and Nave river journey. Again, I mentioned Pandora that is connected to an IP, but very few people go on those attractions because they say, wow, I loved avatar. They go because they're cool attractions. There are plenty of ways. Expedition Everest is a cool attraction despite the Yeti. There are plenty of ways you can make an attraction like this, a cool attraction And yes, you have connections to the past, but that doesn't really, it shouldn't be something that constrains us or keeps us from doing something new. We want to look to the past, but then create something new that is not going to be dated in 10 years that is going to last for the long haul. So before we shift over into World Showcase, I did want to just summarize and talk about a few other little touches that I would love to see. First of all, it's kind of a big one. I like to think of this as a forward thinking plan because this is something that would require a lot more infrastructure even than creating Horizons. And one more thing about Horizons, I do realize that to do what I wanted to do would likely require some huge modifications to the show building, which isn't really designed for that. The Wonders of Life building is very large. A lot of that building may be used for the queue, but also for the post-show area and for some fun hands-on experiences. We would likely need to expand possibly to another show building or even something larger, similar to how they're doing with Guardians of the Galaxy and Universe of Energy, but not on that level, of course. So I wanted to mention that first before I continue. But my idea for a future world that I haven't mentioned yet is I would love to put people movers in future world. I know this is something that did come up during the original designs for Epcot Center, but it was too expensive. And I know in the Communicore area, there were some plans of putting in people movers there. I think 
that one of the challenges with Epcot is just how big it is and how challenging it is to get around. So it's not just a matter here of putting in a people mover just so we can basically have something cool and it can look futuristic. Well, that that's a big part of it. Don't get me wrong. But also that you can travel from one to the other. So my thought is in Future World, you have a people mover that starts on it basically does a loop but it's going to the two it's going to have three stations essentially you're going to have a station on the far end of future world west kind of over there near imagination and the land pavilion in that space there and then you're going to have a station in the middle which is kind of in that area where you're behind Spaceship Earth and you haven't gotten into World Showcase yet, there's going to be an elevated area that you can get on there. And then there's going to be a third station over near the Guardians of the Galaxy area. So essentially, it's going to be a loop, but it's kind of a, it's going to be one of those situations, and this would require some more complicated approaches from Disney, but basically, they're constantly in motion, so you're getting on the vehicles at each station and then they're kind of split off from there and they pick up speed and so there's you know some computer setup there in order to make sure everything is spaced properly and if the situation worked out especially with some of the newer attractions like guardians of the galaxy and new horizons and the imagination pavilion you would try to have a situation where maybe the people movers could give you some sort of view of the attraction now that is a big ask, and I it's funny that I say that given this is all kind of not going to happen. But regardless, this is something with the people movers where I want to have a different view. I want to make that Tomorrowland world on the move idea in future world. Also, I'm adding a lot of trees and making it more that urban garden approach. So why not have a situation where you have that? You walk into Epcot and you're already having the people movers traveling. Not in the entrance right there to get in the way, but people movers come off. Like they may even go over the parking lot on that loop from Guardians of the Galaxy back around that side. But essentially, you're going to have it's not going to be jarring. You're not going to lose sight lines. There's clever ways. You know, you're going to be off the ground, but not super high, kind of like they do the people mover in Tomorrowland. But it's basically a big loop that is going to allow you to very easily get from one spot to another. It also limits where there aren't so many people walking on the pathways. It's also another situation where you're showcasing a technology that is not new, but it still needs to be used more and hasn't been used up to its potential, especially here in the United States with public transportation. But it it provides both. See, that's the thing I, we need. You think even something like the Skyliner. It's a cool technology, but it's also very useful when it's working at its full capacity to get between parks and resorts, especially when you're actually able to park hop. So that's where I want to think of this. This is a way to make it so everyone's not so exhausted, but then also to connect from one end to the other and find a fun way to travel around where it doesn't become such an effort. It's like, wow, this is really cool. Why don't we have this in our area? And so I love this idea and think that it would change completely what Epcot was about. And it's just another really neat attraction that would not have long lines, would allow you, some people would probably just ride the people mover all the time. You're not required to get off at any time. At some point you might get kind of bored, you know, where that that's a situation. But really it's just another way to see the park. And I'm going to have something similar to World Showcase, but I'm going to leave that till later. I'm not going to talk about that now. Another thing, too, is I just like more little touches, like the idea my brother Dave sent me a note after part one and said, you know, what about the talking trash cans? <laughs> and I don't mean push the talking trash can, but I want more things like that they have at Epcot where you take a drink and you hear a voice talking to you or you put something in the trash can and it says, hey, I want a lot of things like that. And that is kind of the wave of the future if you think in terms of things like all the neat touches at Diagon Alley or Galaxy's Edge. But a lot of those in Galaxy's Edge have to do with your phone. I just want there to be more interactive elements spread out throughout the park. So again, because I'm not doing Communicore or Interventions, I want things in each pavilion. And these are things, too, that in today's world of the Internet and Instagram and YouTube and everything, all these little touches for me as a Disney leader are going to help draw more attention to the park and people will come just to do those kinds of things and almost treat it like a scavenger hunt. Can you go find them all? 
and kind of like hidden Mickey's, but making them more interactive. It's, it's all kind of fitting with future world as an inspiring place, but also as a playground. And I don't mean a playground like in a negative way, like, Oh, it's only for kids. I mean like an adult playground where adults and kids can go and do just all these fun things that they can't do at home very easily. And that get them playing together. And they're not directly tied to your phone all the time. They can be tied to so many other things, just interacting with it, kind of taking the best of what we see at museums and science centers and everything, but putting it in the context of Walt Disney World and the attractions we already have and having things related to those, whether it's in the post-show area, outside while you're walking, so many different places, and making that constantly evolve where a new thing shows up and a new technology. And people just have to keep coming back for it because they want to do it all. And that's what we need. We need more buzz for Disney World and Epcot especially. The buzz too much still is that it's tiring, it might be boring, that there's not enough thrill rides, things for kids to do. We need to destroy all of that while turning it into just a place that might please an early Epcot Center fan, might please older guests, still will please kids and be fun. And I know that's a tricky ask, but I think it's possible if Disney really makes some bold moves and doesn't still get stuck in that kind of idea of everything has to have an ROI. The idea that, yes, we can draw guests with Guardians of the Galaxy and sell merch and everything, but two, we need to make this the best experience possible because that's what it's going to take to compete with all the other options. People need to be able to think, we don't want people thinking, I can just stay home and watch Netflix. Why would I want to spend whatever I'm going to have to spend to go to Disney World? We need to make it so cool and so innovative that they have no choice. They have to go. So we've spent about two and a half hours talking about Future World here. I promise it will not be another two and a half for World Showcase. I will summarize a bit more some things. I'm not going to go through every single pavilion, but I want to talk about a lot of them and my overall approach Quickly about dining, I think that Space 220 at Future World, I like it. I didn't mention that earlier. I'd like to continue with what I know about it to continue to have that there. And overall about World Showcase, you know, it's become really important for World Showcase to have festivals. And I like the festivals. They are fun. However, it's to the point where I feel like, in a sense, the festivals have become so common And all the time, with the exception of the Diet Epcot section, that it needs to be tweaked a bit. I think that the the Arts Festival is great. There are a lot of good things about Flower and Garden and Food and Wine. So I wouldn't make any huge adjustments, but I think I would slim back the amount of time a bit. I like the idea of there being times when you're just experiencing Epcot as it is. There are so many cool varieties and things to do. And I know Disney has really been able to keep up attendance at Epcot by turning it into like an annual festival center. And that's not a bad thing. I don't hate the idea of there being frequent festivals. And I didn't mention holidays, but of course that is great too. I think we just need to focus in a bit more and have them be a little smaller. And the only reason for that is I feel like you can still do things individually within the various pavilions. And that's where I want to focus in a little bit more on some changes we can make to pavilions to make them even more exciting and make people want to go to each one. And so the festivals take a little bit of a backseat but still are a big part of Epcot because I know a lot of people love them. They draw a lot of locals. It's super important. And they're also a lot of fun. You know, I would just push myself if I was leading Disney to find new ways to make these festivals unique each year and not copy over most of the same things and realize that they are important to what people love about Epcot, but find different ways to present those festivals where maybe they connect more to the pavilions they're near and you just change it up more and make sure to, here is my biggest thing that I would do for the festivals. And that is find a way to add more places where people can actually eat the food. Now, Grant, you can't clog up all the pathways with tables, but there need to be more spaces where when you buy food, you're not spending your time either walking with it or eating on trash cans. So that would be my biggest change, would be look for more areas where you're able to 
take the food that you purchase or drinks and enjoy them without feeling like you're kind of in some really awkward spot. There are some tables. I would like there to be more of them. That would be my biggest initiative. And also find some better music acts. <laughs> some of them are very good when they have the festivals, but let's mix it up more and have, and I know you have to have bands that cater to a large audience. However, you can either have, sometimes you got to fork over the money and have someone a little more popular or even a little more nuanced I, and bring back the same bands every year. Again, it creates that idea of this place that you go back every year and like, I love Air Supply. I want to see Sugar Ray or something. This isn't me personally. I'm just talking about how <laughs> I should have put quotes around that for both of them. But you get the idea. I And cover bands are fun. There's nothing wrong with a Bon Jovi cover band being an Epcot. Just look for ways to beef up the level entertainment. And that's true across all of World Showcase. And again, I don't want to just go backwards and say we should bring back all these bands that are no longer there. However, the idea of trying to cut back on musicians that have tenure or are members of the union and, you know, going for cheaper acts is something that needs to stop. Disney charges a lot of money to get into Epcot and the level of entertainment while still very good. This is nothing against any of the current entertainment that has been there in the last few years, but the level of entertainment needs to be super high across the board and needs to be prevalent. We can't pull back on the entertainment here. This is something that needs to be like I mentioned with future world, even more important to world showcase. You have your legacy acts that have been there a long time and then you have other acts around that mix in and out, but are providing different types of music, different cultural experiences, and building that up too. So beyond the overall scope, let's look a little bit at a few attractions that are fairly new on the newer side. Uh, because let me talk about my overall idea. My overall idea is that I would like to have more attractions at World Showcase. And I'm not talking about every attraction has to be $300 million or something. The idea is kind of like what they were originally planning before Epcot's budget really went out of control. The idea that when you go to a pavilion, you're going to have the opportunity to eat some great food, have some drinks, do some shopping and experience attractions. Now, I don't know if we could get an attraction in every single one, but I'm going to go through and talk about the areas that I think could use one and, you know, countries that if I'm not eating there, I'm just going to blow by. And I don't like the idea of having it where a few countries get a lot of attention while others not so much. But first, let's talk about Mexico and Norway. Those two kind of get roped together for me. And Mexico has, of course, the Grand Fiesta Tour with the three Caballeros. And I'm just going to say that because I want to add so much to World Showcase, I'm not going to spend that much time destroying what's there or dramatically changing it. I'm not going to change this to Coco. I'm not going to pull back in El Rio del Tiempo, though I love that attraction. However, I think we do need to make a few tweaks. And this is notwithstanding one of the animatronics at Three Caballeros laying face first that we saw recently. This is talking about just tweaks because what I find is with Grand Fiesta Tour, I love the music. I think the final scene is great. I love that initial approach where you get, you take the boat, you go by the San Angel Inn, which um, of course is kind of like the Blue Bayou. It's just so relaxing, so cool. And then you round the corner and you have the three cabrios go, hey, right in your face. And it's like, okay. That's a lot to take. And this is going to be my old man segment right off the bat. But I have a very simple recommendation that I want to make to this attraction, and that is turn down the volume. Now, this is not so we can't hear them, but we need to make this not feel so jarring. And again, it's like I have this thought, again, I'm kind of being the old man. This is more old dad. But I feel like a lot of TV shows that are not the best for kids Often just every character is like yelling at you and not really, but they're all speaking at this feverish high pitch. And there's a little bit of that, especially in the first half of the three Caballeros attraction. So I would look to add more nuance where, I mean, it's fine that Don Donald gets lost. They have to find him. Some hijinks ensue. It's fun. My daughters love this attraction. I don't want to just gut it. 
I just want to find ways to to make it a little less based on screens. So like you saw what they did with the final scene where the screens were pulled out and they were replaced by animatronics, I think that is a great approach. I'm not saying we should do that everywhere, but let's add in a few more animatronics. Let's find a few spots where there's a bunch of screens to pull back or make it less prominent. Because the last thing you want to do with a Disney attraction when you're riding a boat and you're going through sets is then to keep looking at screens. Granted, like the shopping where the screens go by, they had those originally. That's totally fine. It's fine to have screens. Let's just pull back a bit and try to find other ways to tell a story. El Rio del Tiempo had screens. It's okay. But just make some adjustments to make it a little... When I'm looking at attractions, I want them to work for kids, but I also want them to work more for adults. And now there are a lot of adults that like Grand Fiesta Tour, including myself. I placed it, I think, I think it ended up being number 11, but it was in that 9 to 11 range for a long time on my rankings of Epcot attractions that are currently there. So these would be pretty minor changes, but it's kind of like what I was thinking about the imagination, but not to that level, is let's just make a few adjustments to make the attraction stronger and really make use of what's great about it. So like the small world-ish section is great. The finale is, is excellent. The initial approach is great. That area from when you turn around the corner and enter up through about the final third, that's where I really want to focus my time and just give it a little TLC, make a few tweaks that make it an even better attraction that we all want to do. I appreciate attractions like Grand Fiesta Tour that have shorter lines. They're complementary attractions. I just want to make it a little bit better. It's small changes. It's not something that is going to be dramatic but it just strengthens it a bit. That's what we need. We need to strengthen it a bit. And I'm kind of going to take a similar approach with Frozen Ever After, but go a bit further. And I think, first of all, I have to say that I was not happy when Anna and Elsa were getting put into Norway. I thought it made more sense to have that in the Magic Kingdom, Fantasyland, or even in the Hollywood Studios. It didn't seem to make sense here. I will say, especially with the Royal Summer House, I think the way that they have that being like a summer house of theirs that's in Norway, really cool area. And even the queue and a lot of things with Frozen Ever After are done really well. And, you know, and I don't want to oversell Maelstrom. One of the things I love most about Maelstrom near the end was that it had no line and you could easily just walk right on and kind of, and it was fun and it was hokey and that was great. Some of those elements are still in Frozen Ever After. So it wasn't just about closing Maelstrom. And I understand. I still think it's a lot of fun and I would enjoy riding it. And, you know, the way it kind of tried to sum up Norway with all these different things with trolls and oil rigs and everything. The story that Mark Rhodes gave about how they came together. I love that story. It's funny. It involves Joe Rohde and executives. And it's just it's worth listening if you want to check out that podcast because, It really gives an interesting story about Maelstrom. But to talk about Anna and Elsa, I also was nervous when they were going to do it that this was going to open the floodgates where then Disney was going to just keep putting more and more characters throughout World Showcase. They haven't really done much more, though now, of course, they are adding... Well, they've done a few in France, where Beauty and the Beast sing-along and Ratatouille, which I will get to in a bit. Leading into Frozen Ever After, I will say that I was not a fan. However, I can see the charms of Frozen Ever After. The Let It Go scene is great. I think that that scene is incredible. The way you go up, the initial lift hill, there's some cool effects there. And even the way they use the Maelstrom ride system, they keep it being a lot of fun. A lot of the core elements of the attraction work really well. I'm not going to tear this out because I feel like One, I have other big things I want to do in World Showcase. I don't want to get distracted by this. And two, I feel like there is something to be said. We've had two Frozen films. We have an attraction that works about 75% of where I want it to be. So let's fill in the other 25%. So what I would do there is there's this dead space in this attraction that does not need to be there. We need more sets. We need more backdrops. We need additional things going on in scenes. It doesn't mean just make it busy. We just need to make it feel like a complete attraction. Okay, there was an overlay that had a tight time frame. Disney met it. They had an attraction that breaks a lot, but they ultimately got an attraction that did a good job. So now that we have some time and the attraction seems to mostly work pretty well and is popular, let for lack of a better term, let's plus it. So let's make sure that a lot of elements of the attraction are beefed up. But the story doesn't really make total sense. Maybe there's elements of Frozen 2, I mean, indirectly or directly you could put in there. Let's make sure that this attraction is more than just, hey, there's some characters I like. Oh, wow, that's a pretty cool scene. And now we do some fun drops. Let's just make it more. 
you know, um, I understand why it's there. I understand that what is needed. I know a lot of people like it. This is where I'm fighting against my own kind of old Epcot Center person um, ideas. But to me, I look at it and I think I am good with Grand Fiesta Tour and Frozen now that they're there. I would just like to see, especially with Frozen Ever After, even more than Grand Fiesta Tour, the attraction feel complete and feel like something that is worthy of being a headliner at Walt Disney World. So we're going to spend a decent amount of time on this. It's going to be more than Grand Fiesta Tour. Front to back, really look at each scene and say, does this work? Does this work? What can we do to make it better? And really make Frozen Ever After what it should be. So those two pavilions, that's about all I'm going to do there. But now I'm going to talk about some pavilions where I'm going to add more things is what I like to do. So I know we're already over an hour, and I want to make sure I have plenty of time to talk about your ideas. So I'm going to move pretty rapid fire now through areas that I think are in good shape or need some small changes that have current attractions. So that's what I'm going to talk about for a minute here. Let's start with an easy one, the American Adventure. I really don't think we should make any significant changes to the American Adventure. If I was in charge, my goal would be to obviously at some point update the film at the end. And, you know, way down the road, I do think extending it where then the show might talk about things in the 1960s at least as we move a bit more into the future because now the last scene is well before that. So that's all I would really do, but I'm not going to do that yet. And I think the American Adventure still really works as long as the audio and video stay high. We're in good shape there. Moving on to Canada, they just released Canada Far and Wide, which I think is really well done. I like the approach that it feels more timeless, that it could be there for a long time. And the narration by Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, great choices. Canada Far and Wide can stay in place for a really long time. I'm glad to see that Disney is making updates to its Circle Vision films. I'm not sure I expected that to happen until they announced it. So that pavilion's good. I'm not going to make any other changes to Canada. Same with American Adventure that are significant beyond ensuring that, you know, maybe if the dining plan doesn't come back, that would be my approach. But I know I'm not in charge of that is to keep the dining plan from coming back and make sure the restaurants are unique and have extensive menus and, again, aren't so expensive like Ocelier has, speaking of Canada. So that would be an overall approach that I would take just in terms of the dining plan and what I would want to do there. So let's move on to China. So I'm making the assumption that the film Wondrous China is being created and we're going to bring this to life, especially, hopefully, in the future when the um, political tensions aren't so high and that it will get released, let's say, in 2021 with the new Circle Vision Seamless Circle Vision technology, and it's going to be great. So China, you've got an attraction. You're doing awesome. You're going to stay in place. So let's move on to France. <laughs> so France, Beauty and the Beast sing along, done. We're going to take that as a sunk cost. The day I take over, the day it closes. It's just not, it does not fit there. We're not going to play music from Beauty and the Beast regularly taking over the France Pavilion. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. So Beauty and the Beast is going to be replaced by Impressions to France. At some point in the future, we will do an update to it with more modern shots, but we will try to use what we already have and just adjust it, especially when you're looking at some landmarks and you have better film technology. But they did update the film in terms of the uh, Make It 4K. So that's good. It still looks great. Impressions of France all day showing in France. The reason I also feel good about that, too, is that we are going to open Ratatouille next year now, given COVID, of course. But I think that that is a situation where characters do fit well in Epcot. I also think it's going to be very popular. We need something to offset my enhanced version of Frozen Ever After on the other side of the lagoon. So they're going to basically sit at opposite ends and be successful ways you can draw people with Disney characters. But that also means I don't need to add any more Disney characters because I have Grand Fiesta to a lesser extent, but I have Anna and Elsa and Ratatouille on the opposite ends. We're going to have character greetings and everything, but again, they're going to be done in a way that does not feel off-putting, that fits with the country. So really, I feel like France with Ratatouille and Oppressions to France and the restaurants and, of course, ice cream and sandwiches and everything, that pavilion's in great shape. 
we pull Beauty and the Beast out of there and we're all set. So that's what I would do for France. United Kingdom. I would not add a Mary Poppins attraction. I would, you can meet Mary Poppins. That's great. And I wouldn't even really focus my efforts to add an attraction there. I really like the idea of that garden in the back with the gazebo being a comfortable place. I would add more shade back there. I would make it an even more comfortable setting to have bands play. I think that's a great area to chill at. I think Rose and Crown is cool. You know, there's little tweaks I would make to every country, and that would almost be its own podcast in itself. Well, it would be, given how long this is going. But I'm not going to focus on adding Mary Poppins to the United Kingdom. I mean, I didn't hate the idea if it was done well. I think a dark ride could be really cool. But instead, I'm going to focus on a few other countries. So United Kingdom is going to basically stay as is. So I'm going to do one more here. Morocco. I'm not going to add an attraction to Morocco. I do feel like we need to take a close look at the restaurants, make sure that they are really top notch. I know I heard Restaurant Marrakesh maybe has been going a bit downhill. Would spruce that up. Make sure we have live entertainment in Morocco. Make sure we have a lot going on there. But I'm okay having some countries that are just a really cool atmosphere, have multiple restaurants, have live entertainment. That's great. So you're thinking, Dan, what are you going to do in World Showcase? Well, we're going to get to that really soon. Before I get to my ideas for the countries I have not mentioned yet, I will say that whenever the COVID pandemic resolves itself in some way, we are reigniting the cultural representative program in World Showcase. And I would like to do it even better than we did before. I don't know enough about how it runs behind the scenes, but I think that there need to be people in every country from that country. That was a really cool part of what made World Showcase click. And I know Disney has done a lot of cutbacks and in programs, including the Disney College program and this representative program. A lot of things, understandably so, to cut costs and due to the dangers of the pandemic. My hope is that they don't use this as an opportunity to not bring it back due to operating costs and say, well, it's not worth, we're not getting enough out of it. We noticed that we did surveys and people don't really seem to care. And that's dangerous to me. I feel like you need to make World Showcase what it is. One of the ways you could do that is by having people from the countries there. So one of my big goals here, though, I'm trying to keep it more narrow because I'm not going to say put, a, put an attraction in every country. There need to be more attractions more rides in World Showcase. We have seen where you have the pavilions that have attractions in general are a lot more popular, especially the pavilions with rides, Norway and Mexico. There, plus, you have over there things like La Cava and Margarita Stand and even you know the Princess Meals there. There's a lot going on over there. And even right next to them, you have China right there with a film. And then it's kind of like, well... um, we got this big stretch of space with Germany and Italy. They don't have rides or any type of other attractions. You're going there to eat and drink. And that's not a bad thing, especially I like the giant pretzels in Germany. I would make an effort to not have them be $10, but you know, that's another podcast. But really, we're going to do we're going to put an attraction, we're going to put a ride in Germany. It doesn't have to be the Rhine River, but we're going to use that show building that was supposed to hold the Rhine River attraction. It is not going to include characters. It is going to be a water attraction that in some way goes through the countryside of Germany. It's going to be a fun adventure that really... Um, takes us in the black forest you could even have things with folklore there's a lot of interesting ways you can do germany without just going to obvious tropes i, I mean of course if i'm talking about folklore there's a lot of things you know you'd just be like let's have the brothers grim or you know something there's a lot of different ways to do that however there are ways to make a really cool fun attraction again you don't want it to be just like frozen ever after but i think there's a lot there and I feel like you need to have more draws in that central corridor where you go through and you have Germany, Italy, American Adventure, Japan. The only of the four that has an attraction is a 40-minute show, basically, in the American Adventure, which is nice. But you need to have rides. And this central group of countries that are surrounding American Adventure is where I want to focus. So I would add a boat ride to Germany, and I would make that a top priority 
in order to expand crowds. But also, right now, Germany is kind of a packed area where you have, you know, Summerfest, and then, of course, the beer garden, and then you have the beer stand. A lot of people go there. You know, that's a popular place. I've waited in lines at several areas, several beer stands, and to get a giant pretzel, and I've now mentioned that twice. And, of course, the beer garden's really cool. But you still should be able to use that show building, expand back, and to add an attraction there. Moving on to Italy, same deal. We need an attraction in Italy. You know, I really realized that, you know, if you look at it and you go Mexico, Norway, Germany, Italy, all water rides. Now, I really like the idea, and I know it's kind of a cliche, but I did like the gondola idea that was put forth. And where Germany, to me, is more a bit more thrilling and adventurous, I like to think of Italy as being more laid back, and you just kind of are moseying around through the area in the back. Be a lot of building that would need to happen there. And I don't know if you would make it just through Venice, essentially, could be a way to do it. But this would be a more relaxing boat ride that allows you to experience a little bit of Italy in a really attractive setting. Now, it might be a case where you would make it indoors and kind of mimic the outside. I would like it to be kind of be a mix, maybe. There's interesting ways you could do that. But you think about, though, going there in Italy right now, I mean, with Via Napoli being very popular, and then, of course, you have the other main restaurant there, too. But it's mostly just for eating. And I know eating is a big part of going to Italy. Pizza, of course, is great. Wine, everything is great. But I would love to have an attraction there. It would just change the whole dynamic of that area. And it wouldn't have to be a big headliner. I think Italy's would be more complimentary attraction. Germany's would be more a D or an E ticket. So you kind of have the two going next to each other, kind of in a way like Mexico and Norway work, where you have kind of the bigger draw and then the slightly lesser draw, but they both are going to draw people. So I would do that for Italy. Last thing, Japan. I would like to add a show into Japan. It does not meet the world. We're not just going back, but I would like to... There is a space where they were going to put a show, and now it's used for storage and everything else, that could still be set up that way. I would like it to be more of an entertainment show that looks back at Japanese culture and is not done in a cliched way. It's not trying to present the entire history of the country. It could be a mix of live performers, films, sets, you know, using the latest technologies. I think I say that phrase over and over, using the latest technologies. But I would like it to be a show because, again, you're mixing types of experiences. Now, if you look at putting that in, and you look at World Showcase on the whole, you have two Circle Vision films in Canada and China. You have a sit-down American adventure. You have rides in Mexico, Norway, Germany, Italy, and France. Five rides, plus another film impressions to France. And then this show in Japan, which would be more than just entertainment. It would be a, this wouldn't be in the same tone, but something like the Mystery Lodge or even the show at the library in Springfield of Abraham Lincoln. Something that uses those kinds of effects, like Pepper's Ghost, but to another degree, and just really uses the, the best in-theater effects to create something. And you would have to, this would be a case, though, where, again, you have to be really culturally appropriate. So I would want this to be led by Imagineers from Japan that work in Japan, not have it be led by um, a white guy and then have him get a consultant. We don't need a consultant. We need this to be led by people that know, that grew up in Japan, that know the area, and that can really make this something that is special and honors the country and the people and you can be proud of. And that's what I like to see there. So that would be my show in Japan. So those are the main updates to World Showcase. But I'm gonna, I have one more big update that I want to talk about in a bit. But those updates are the ones that would be the enhancements before I kind of have the big headliner that I'm going to add. But those are the enhancements that would make World Showcase a cooler place. So here's the last thing. This would be the big project, kind of like with New Horizons and with the Imagination Pavilion. Those are kind of the three big things. And after this, of course, I will talk about the nighttime show. But we need one new pavilion in World Showcase. Actually, I think we need two. But in terms of what I would do, I would start with one. We have not had a new pavilion since the 1980s. So I think that let's just start with a single pavilion. And I would like to put it between Germany and China. I know there's the African outpost right there, but that can be removed. I think that space makes the most sense if you look at maps where, or just where you're walking a long way and talking about something where, again, I'm looking at 
the importance of having Ratatouille in France and the draw there, you're still going to have a lot of people going to this side of World Showcase. But again, too, with imagination being overhauled, I'll have people kind of heading from the other side just based on that. But regardless, here's the big thing. When I look at what is in World Showcase, the types of countries, we have you know, United Kingdom, Norway, Germany, and Italy, and France, all from Europe. You have Morocco as kind of the lone African country, and then you have Japan and China from Asia, and then Mexico, Canada, and the United States. So you can see where, in general, we are really zoning in on certain Western countries. So what I would think is the, and I haven't totally decided on this, I think I'm leaning in a certain direction. I would like to have either, for the two new pavilions, we need one from South America and one from Africa. And I think those are the two big areas that don't have enough, especially South America, that don't have enough representation in World Showcase. It doesn't need to be perfect, but these are two giant continents. And with Africa, you just have Morocco, and then you don't have anything from South America. And so I look at it, and I I know that they were very close to putting in Brazil, and for various reasons that wasn't announced at D23 Expo. Of course, it would have been put on hold, I suspect, anyway, given where we are right now. But so my thing is that I would probably start with Africa, and I love the idea they called Equatorial Africa, because if I was going to pick one country from Africa, I mean, you could do Egypt, you could do South Africa, but I like the idea of expanding it more. Now, there are, this is a very problematic choice if you're not careful, where you're trying to summarize Africa with one country. I mean, the thing is, though, Disney has done this with all the countries, and yes, Everything that is in each country, like seeing the Eiffel Tower in France or the beer garden in Germany, it rolls into cliches about the countries. That is true. But I would think, I mean, I think about what they've done with Africa in the Animal Kingdom and Harambe, and I think there has to be a way to create an African pavilion that is respectful of the country, that, that you know, is going to have some typical things you might expect from Africa, but also is with all the research out there and all the experts, when Disney originally created Epcot, they consulted with so many experts, like for Space of Birth, for example, you could do that for a country in World Showcase, but also need to make it fun. But there would be no characters in here. This is not connected to some future movie. And I'm not asking them just to take the ideas from that were put in place for the African pavilion that was supposed to come a few years after Epcot opened. However, I do really like the idea of another theater attraction here, and I know you're you're right next to China with Circle Vision 360, but again, it might be something that's more not just Circle Vision, but it could be a mix, too, of I would like to have a ride and a show here. I have not fleshed that out that much. Now, you got to be careful. We don't want it because there's not going to be animals here. I don't feel like there's a huge risk with making this feel like the animal kingdom. It would be tricky. The ride, I feel like, is trickier. The show, you can really just... I like the idea of almost, in a sense, like having you be immersed within the area where you're standing in the middle and it's interacting with you. This is a pretty rough sketch right now. And I think, um, again... I'm looking at it as I love this idea and I feel like World Showcase needs a new pavilion and this pavilion would include, you know, a restaurant, ride and show, like I mentioned, and really the show would be the e-ticket. The ride would be like a COD ticket, would be a complimentary attraction, but the show would use the best technology Disney has and create something that's culturally appropriate, but also fun and epic and just, you know, I think about standing in there and just somehow recreating the, the feeling of going to Victoria Falls and that experience and just all the various just incredible landmarks there are, too, and then mixing that up. I mean, you could do here another situ- thing you could do with the ride is do some sort of flying theater. And I know we have Soren on the other end, and this might seem redundant but a different approach to it. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but there's a lot of interesting things you could do there with a motion simulator. Again, something that is not designed for thrills, but um, soaring over Africa. It's a little lazy, but I think it would be cool. And then the second country, let's assume we do this. The second country, I think, would be, it could be Brazil, Argentina. I'm not sure 
exactly which country you would do there, but I think um, we need a representative from South America in World Showcase because you can really call it a World Showcase if you put all that together. So finally, talking about the nighttime show. The nighttime show at Epcot should not be character-based, so I think we need to go back to the drawing board here. I'm not saying we keep Epcot forever. That'll play for the short term just while we're getting everything together and harmonious. We're losing that title. What I really loved about the illuminations before Reflections of Earth was the way that the countries were all lit up and we had songs from each country and it really seemed to celebrate the world showcase in each country. Illuminations Reflections of Earth is incredible and I think the story is grand and epic and cool, but... We need to have a nighttime show that is more, I look at this as a world showcase show that is, again, spotlighting the countries and the music. And the idea of Harmonious focusing on music is not a bad idea in general, but music, fireworks, lasers, projections, the whole deal. This would be the show for World Showcase. It would be something that would be just blow us away. So I think that would be a few years down the road, but I would not proceed you know, nothing against. I love Moana. I think Coco's great. I don't need to see scenes from that projected with music and fireworks onto the lagoon. It's just not something I need to see. I, I'm sure Harmonious will end up being great, but that is not what I would go forward with if I was in charge of World Showcase. All right, now it is your turn. I have received plenty of cool ideas from you that I want to talk about here on this show. And we're going to stick with World Showcase first. Paul Lane on Twitter, given recent events, another World Showcase pavilion dedicated to an African nation that shows off African culture is ideal. I promise that I did not say this just to make myself seem smarter, (laughs) but Paul, I agree with you as you just heard. And I also do think that given our current cultural climate, this, I mean, any time is the perfect time to add pavilions that expand the idea of World Showcase to being much more beyond Europe and a few countries in Asia and other places. So, But I do think that it's even more that way given what is currently going on in our country. So on a related note about World Showcase, I am now going to play an audio recording from my brother, Dave Heaton. He is a smart guy like me, has gone to Walt Disney World many times as a kid on car trips, has gone a few times recently with his family. He has some thoughts about World Showcase. So take it away, Dave. Dan, my thoughts on Epcot Center is that they should double down on the World Showcase idea, add more countries, add more food, culture, areas to walk around that resemble countries, and kind of dial back the future side of it. I mean, the future is changing all the time. Um, It's not, not really for the better. And, um, you know, they should keep Spaceship Earth and a few other things, but really focus on the World Showcase side of it. Acknowledge the fact people are going there mostly to drink and eat and wander around some pretty places that resemble other countries. Um, You know, it'd be great to have some more rides, kind of um, unambitious rides like the Mexico ride and things like that. So that's my ideas. Take it for what you will. Thanks. It's interesting, too. Dave's about two and a half years older than me, and I've been really pushing on the future world side. I do love World Showcase, but for him to talk really about, like he says, diminishing the future world side and focusing more on World Showcase, a lot of his ideas are very similar to mine about adding more countries, and he even talks about unambitious rides, um, which I think some of my ideas, especially for Italy, were that way. So I agree, and I do think that World Showcase is the draw for a lot of people to Epcot. So Disney should, while Future World is easier to talk about in some ways because I think it needs more work and more updates, World Showcase to me is already good, but there's just ways to make it even better. And I think that's what Dave was getting at with his comments. So it was really cool to hear for the first time From a person that knows Disney very well, Dave Heaton. I also have a thought here from Ellerbert on Twitter. Her 10-year-old said that who asked her while watching The Hunchback of Notre Dame why Disney doesn't turn that into a ride. So a 10-year-old would put Notre Dame-themed thrill ride in the France Pavilion. So (laughs) the France Pavilion would just be so packed. We've just had so many things there. Though having been to Notre Dame, I think it's really cool that 
it's a it's a really neat place and so i enjoy kind of more out of the box ideas especially from a younger set i did ask my daughter and she was just talking about how they needed to make finding nemo a lot better make the seas pavilion much better she's also 11 so the kids also have a lot of ideas i think i could do a whole thing where i just asked my daughter what she wanted to do in the parks and that might be a fun thing at some point in the future Tim Grassi of the Marty Called Podcast also had an interesting idea. He sent me an article that I'll put in the show notes that he wrote in 2014. The article was kind of more about Frozen Ever After and what it meant for Epcot. He described character infusion as the laziest form of Imagineering and cited things like Stitch's Great Escape, Grand Fiesta Tour, The Seas with Nemo Friends. And of course, this was before Frozen Ever After actually was added. Tim was not very thrilled about Frozen going there, given that it didn't seem to fit. But here's an interesting idea that Tim brought up that I wanted to mention. He would like to move It's a Small World to Showcase Plaza in Epcot. I find this really interesting. And Tim knows this is not something that would actually happen. At least I believe that's the case. And his idea is essentially move small world out of fantasy land open up an area that is a traffic bottleneck this was at the time in 2014 but that hasn't really changed up to this point and to then put it in where essentially it's a small world debuted at the 1964 season of our world's fair of course it showcases the world this is tim's statement it showcases the children of the world in a romanticized way it is unquestionably the perfect attraction to bridge future world and world showcase so i haven't really talked about an idea of bridging the two and that's interesting because in a sense it's a small world was from the 1964 65 world's fair which epcot has a lot of influences Huge influences on Epcot Center from that and other world's fairs, and that it also has different countries. So in a way, it does bridge the two and would be really amazing to have that there. I don't I mean, obviously, I don't think it's going to happen, but I like the idea. I like that type of thinking. I once did a blog post where I thought, let's find some distinct attractions, but put them in entirely new places. One of mine was to put Dream Flight in the upstairs where Circle of Life was and redo that, which I still think is a great idea given the connections to Soren. But those kinds of ideas I really like, something that's a little more out of the box and could really work if um, Disney was willing to take some chances and just try some kind of off-the-wall things. Next up, I'm going to play another audio clip. We are going to return again to Mike Fischetti, who submitted something last week. He has a few really cool ideas. We're going to hear from him twice. But first, here are some thoughts that Mike has about World Showcase, especially interesting one about the American Adventure. Take it away, Mike. I would redo the American Adventure. Uh, I think it's time for us to consider redoing the American Adventure and rename it, make it a show called Voices of America. And have it be something akin to like a Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Basically, try to have a show about America where the words are coming from either average people or words that are coming from some famous Americans and then some lesser known uh, American figures. And have their words speak to the American journey and what this country has gone through how far it has come, and how far it still has to go. And that is something that can very much be as moving a tribute and be on par with the American adventure that we sort of have now. And I would add an attraction in Japan. I really think Japan is a, is a pavilion that desperately needs an attraction, more so than any of the others. Although I would say I would probably go to the UK and install a Mary Poppins themed attraction using the same ride technology as Peter Pan's flight. Those are really interesting ideas. I'm going to kind of go backwards here. I think the Mary Poppins idea is good. I do love the idea of using the Peter Pan's flight technology, which has been used well more recently with some of the overseas parks, but also going back to the original Disneyland, and then the versions that have sprung up since. So that's really cool. Uh, An attraction in Japan, I think, is like I mentioned, is something that would be great. It's a popular pavilion. They did add a new restaurant there, but adding an attraction would really complete that pavilion and make it excellent. I want to talk about the American Adventure. It's really interesting to me because I think part of what 
Mike is describing of having these lesser known people and their voices does come through in certain scenes like the Washington cross and the Delaware scene or the guys at the gas station. There is some of that, but zoning in on Howard Zinn, that book is a real eye opener, especially it's a, if you haven't read it, it's something where it really gives you an idea of just, and I wouldn't even say controversial or anything, but it unveils some myths and legends about people and how things were much different than we might have thought, but then also really digs into like it's described, the people's history of the United States. And that fits to me. I think the American adventure is similar, but obviously is not presented in as realistic a way. But there, that's an interesting idea of starting an entirely new show within that pavilion and making it something a bit different, which could open up a lot of eyes, especially to young audiences. Now we're going to shift back to Future World because I have not really done Future World East in terms of your thoughts, so I thought there were some good comments still that I wanted to hit on from there. Here's a comment that I got on Instagram from John Dickhouse, which is, my idea is submitted with the goal of solving the Ipcot, IPcot versus Epcot Center debate for the long term. The former Wonders of Life Pavilion is notoriously underutilized at the present. With the growth of AI and immersive experiences, it would be innovative for Disney to dedicate the money and technology to reviving this future world pavilion as a bridge between past and present. The in the pavilion anchored by an attraction that uses VR technology that allows users to ride past attractions such as the past versions of Spaceship Earth, The Living Seas, Journey to Imagination, World of Motion, Universe of Energy, and of course, the gold standard, Horizons. Before I talk about that, I wanted to mention a similar idea that's going there, which is Jason Zambricki, who says, We have all seen how far VR has come from an entertainment standpoint. Experiences like the Void Star Wars at Disney Springs are so realistic and a lot of fun. I'm sure the Play Pavilion at the Wonders of Life building will be fun, but my idea would be to scrap that and turn it into a VR experience where guests can ride defunct attractions through VR. We know we're not getting attractions like Horizons or World of Motion or Dream Flight back, but how cool would it be to experience them virtually? There's so much awesome ride footage thanks to places like Retro WDW. I'm sure programmers can make an authentic looking experience. I know capacity could be an issue, but it's a fairly big building. It could even be just one attraction at a time. Have Horizons for four to six months, swap it out with a new attraction. Wouldn't be the same as writing the original, be pretty awesome, and would give new generations of fans to have an experience with those classics. This is a great idea. I love the idea of Disney finding a new way to present these older attractions and also to test the virtual reality technology. I think it's one of those cases where they might give it a shot. I mean, Disney has so many people that um, are nostalgic. They really thrive on looking back at that legacy in certain ways. A lot of times they focus on the same things like Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion. It's a small world and Walt Disney and his history, but not as much with attractions from Epcot or extinct attractions that are gone. It's a little better now with the Imagineering story coming out. They've leaned into it a bit more. I don't think this leadership would ever do this, but I do think if you had a leadership at Disney that was more realizing that they have not taken enough advantage of this and came out and started, you know, focusing on selling documentaries about different attractions and parks music from the past and just more on that level, this would all fit into that. And I think they could, that is a good space where even if you want to have character greetings and other things in there, having one area that is a virtual experience of older attractions would be incredible. Now, I don't think it's going to happen, but I love the idea of that because like others, like Jason says, we're not likely to get these attractions again, but instead of all of us just trying to find the best YouTube versions of these attractions, you're able to do something very different and experience it this way, which I think could be a lot of fun. Now, I want to talk about a little bit more about intellectual property. So first, I'm going to read a comment comments from... David Patchell, and then I'm going to play a audio clip from Jeremiah Panhorse relating to something he'd like to see in any park. I've checked with him, and he would like to see this at Epcot. So I think this is all related to the idea of IP and what we do there. Here's David. Wonders of Life. Since the Guardians of the Galaxy attraction is already well underway, plans for the new play pavilion would be scrapped, and a Black Panther attraction would be housed here instead. It would offer a Universe of Energy-style look at Africa with fun comic book motifs thrown in for good measure. And then he talks about Guardians of the Galaxy. He says the budget's been maxed out. 
You finish the attraction, but this corner of the park becomes a small Marvel-themed area, with characters appearing around the two pavilions and a Marvel-themed restaurant added where space permits, perhaps behind the Black Panther building. I know this idea wouldn't be all received, but it makes sense considering what is already there and the popularity of the Marvel characters. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and play this clip from Jeremiah Panhorst about his idea, and then I'll talk about all of this together in one big response. Here is Jeremiah. Hello, Dan. This is Jeremiah Panhorst here with a rise suggestion for your upcoming podcast. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. Something, no surprise, Star Wars related. Okay, something that can expand that universe that's going on there in the parks. And my idea was a walkthrough experience ride kind of thing where we introduce all these Star Wars elements, but in an escape room type of thing. So Imagine a big building where you have multiple chambers, and each chamber will take a set of group of people. I'm thinking somewhere between four to six people at a time, and you would weaponize these people. They would get some type of a shooting laser gun, okay, and each chamber is going to go through these different a set of chambers where you are trying to escape so you you know set the set the environment as you're trying to get off of either starship or something cool like that you have stormtroopers and things chasing after you and of course the idea is to work together as a team to get through each element um, with of course having this all maybe timed we you know and where you you have to work together as a team to figure out how to get to through to the next room, okay? And like I said, in the meantime, you could have different elements where it feels like stormtroopers are maybe shooting at you. You have to shoot back or have targets you have to shoot at different things. And of course, you could gain points that way. And then as you get through every room at the end there, you'll be able to have bragging rights depending on how well you did as a team, as a group. But I was thinking that'd be kind of cool. I thought kind of VR, but I thought VR might be too much. I don't know. There's other technologies you could, of course, use out there with screens and lasers and things like that that maybe they could utilize. But basically, it's be a cool walking experience. What do you think? All right, so there's my idea. Uh, You take care, my friend. And of course, as always, I'm loving your podcast. Thanks for all the hard work you do for it. I should also mention Jeremiah is one of the hosts of the Mouse House Weekly podcast, if you're interested in checking that out. So he's taking a very different view, which is Star Wars in Epcot and just have it in more parks. And I understand that. I think that I wanted to bring this up because it's easy for me as somebody who's looking at Epcot as this kind of historical area with, you know, what can we do to bring horizons and journey of imagination, everything back. There is a strong contingent of people that are just like, why? Why do we want to do that? Let's go and look toward And I don't know if Jeremiah is this way or not. I'm just saying to the future, let's bring in Star Wars. Let's bring in Marvel. Let's make Epcot this cool park because that's what I like with Disney and that's what I want to do. And that's fine. That's okay. You know, it's interesting to me, too, just because, you know, they could create something really amazing. And I would go and be like, I love this. Now, there's a part of me, though, that would go and be like, this is wrong. This is so wrong. But I'm trying to be more open minded here. And that's what I've tried to do with this podcast to not just think of Epcot as far as one thing. It can be a lot of different things. Now, this might not be my choice, but just in terms of Jeremiah's specific idea, It reminds me a little bit of The Void, but I know he did mention that maybe it wouldn't be virtual reality. But I do think, in general, for Star Wars, the idea of a team going through and doing a mission kind of thing is cool. I don't don't know how that would work in terms of capacity and how that would come together, because that's always an issue, especially with something popular like Star Wars. But I think there's something to be said for a shared experience like that and getting to go, you know, complete a mission. You're kind of doing that with Smuggler's Run a bit, but it's a little different. And so that could work. I don't know if Epcot's the right place, but so much depends on where Disney would go with it. And then back to David's. You know, it's interesting. I know Jim Hill talked a lot about this Black Panther idea and how Wakanda could go in. And it must have been something that was being considered at Disney. Of course, Black Panther is covered by the Avengers contract. So Black Panther himself could not have his image actually at the park. So it'd be one of those weird things where they would have Wakanda and they would have certain characters 
that are not Black Panther, and you you know, come in and go, where's Black Panther? But set that aside, let's assume they figure that out. The idea of a Marvel corner there is kind of an interesting one. And, you know, I love Black Panther the movie. I think Wakanda is really interesting. There's a, I, There are definitely some Epcot connections there when I look at kind of the technology and things, the underground technology they're using in terms of transportation. That's really interesting. So if Disney's really going to say we are going full out the other way and they decide we're going to put a Marvel corner there, you could do a lot worse than Wakanda, again, assuming that it would be able to with Black Panther. And then, of course, his idea of a universe of energy-style look at Africa, that's interesting, too, because in a sense, you're getting people in the door with Black Panther and Marvel, but then you're presenting something that almost fits with the ideas that I was putting at Africa at World Showcase. (laughs) So it's kind of funny how that flips around, where it's not really what I was looking at that way. One more from Ellerbert. She did have another thought in terms of sponsorship model at Future World and thinking that there are companies like Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, SpaceX that could be really good fits. She mentions Test Track and Mission Space as fine attractions, but if they had a sponsor, a visionary sponsor like Tesla or even SpaceX, you could really improve the edutainment value. I think that's an interesting idea, too. I've kind of thought of the idea that Epcot's moving away from sponsorship. This is not criticizing the comment at all, but if they were looking, I've always thought SpaceX would be a good sponsor, especially given their recent successes was actually sending a person from the United States up to the International Space Station. They seem to have a really bright future and there could be something really cool right there. So I'm going to play one more clip as we're starting to wind down. One more from Mike Fischetti here about his ideas for a Horizons 2.0. If given the opportunity, I would say the, the one that we need is almost something like, and this is actually, I mean, this is a larger idea I have. Maybe it would get rid of Mission Space at large and instead construct a kind of Horizons 2.0, where it's a ride like the Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, where you get into this enclosure that surrounds you. In that case, it's like more like 180 degrees or 360 degrees, and you control the ship. None of this going on a fast-paced mission to collect something with lots of hiccups along the way, that's not what this park should be about. This park shouldn't be about the quick, cheap thrills. This should be an experience, an overall positive experience. And so I think, uh, imagine the, the end films at the end of Horizons, the one where you choose your ending. So imagine those kinds of films, but done as a short ride where you are in control of the vehicle. You get to fly the ship through space and see the stations and see all these things. You get to uh, guide the submarine underwater. You get to fly over the desert. And it could be something unlike anything else in the world. And that, to me, could be more inspiring and more interesting than any other thrill attraction out there. This is a really fun idea to me. I love the point of making a thrill ride, but also having it connect to Horizons and using that Smuggler's Run technology. You're kind of merging all the various different elements from the past and the present. It's kind of like what I talked about in terms of bridging the past to get to the future. It's neat because it takes a technology that people are enjoying and makes it, though, something different. I I like the point you're not just trying to pick up stuff like you are in Smuggler's Run. You're actually doing something entirely new and basically enjoying parts of Horizons, especially like the final scene. It's it's interesting. I like this out of the box thinking, and I wish we saw more different uses of technology from Disney that were on that level, which we just don't see enough in the parks. And I think Mike has some really cool ideas there. This has been an epic show. I'm going to close with one more comment from a listener, and that is by Chris Roberts, who actually responded very recently, and he had a bunch of good ideas. And one thing he mentioned, too, about why we connect so strongly with old Epcot and what stands out to him is that, you know, you have the classic dark ride formula, but each of the pavilions told a story, whether it was a history of communication, scientific progress, transportation, creativity, et cetera. And that's what he liked about, too, along with the optimistic tone. And I am totally on board with that. Another thing he would do is he would he would add some new pavilions. One of the pavilions that he would like to see 
is a pavilion that takes a deep dive into ancient civilizations. There may or may not be a ride component, but that it would guests could experience what it's like to wander through ancient Rome, Maya, Persia, China. Very interesting stuff. I know he says Spaceship Earth hints at this, but it'd be more detailed. Another thing he mentions is a pavilion that explores the music and dance of the world. That sounds fun. I think that could be great. You know, it's all about two. Think about if Disney actually did this world celebration. What is a better way to have a celebration of the world than to talk about music and dance? I think that would be fun. I also think that might be neat to do something like that where it's the nighttime show. I know Harmonious was going to be exploring elements of music, but why not extend it to music and dance rather than the music of Disney films? One other thing he mentioned is a pavilion that explores civics and human advancement. He says this would be the hardest to pull off because there are some milestones in society that were good things, like the um, end of the age of kings, the abolishment of slavery and such. You could talk about achievements there. He even mentioned taking a page from Schoolhouse Rock, possibly. So he's looking at it in terms of, instead of just saying future world, the idea more of issues relating to society and our community. And I think that's really cool. I like these ideas a lot. And if you want to read the full comment from Chris, you could go to the blog post um, from episode 110, Improving Epcot Part 1. His whole comment is in there. He has some other ideas that I didn't even mention, and I'll have that in the show notes too. I have one last idea that I wanted to talk about, which I haven't gotten to so far, which is the idea in World Showcase of Transportation. I I mentioned the people movers in Future World. I would like to do something where you have a boat system that takes you around World Showcase, possibly on the edge of the lagoon. And it really has multiple stops. It doesn't stop at every country. This relates a little bit to Tony Baxter's comments about what he wanted to do in Westcott. If you haven't listened to the bonus episode of the season pass where he goes into this, it is worth giving a bit of money for that. It's incredible. Tony talks about this boat system that would kind of take you around and drop you off in various places. I love this idea so much. I don't know how it would work. I don't know how you would stop and start and everything, but I think it's an amazing idea that I would love to explore more. Again, World Showcase, exhausting. You walk around, you're tired. It wears you out. This is a way to essentially go around the lagoon, have a relaxing, shaded ride, not just those boats that go across the lagoon. And you're also, maybe there's ways to incorporate different things to talk about the countries as you go by. Think about the canal tours in Chicago, something like that, where you're essentially, or even, you know, in Paris, right? A better example, but you're essentially seeing architecture and pointing out things and learning things and not having to walk all the way around the entire lagoon. All right, well, we are winding down. I tried to keep this under two hours, which is crazy because I've never had a show this long before. And to do it as a two-part show each time, insane. But this was really fun to do. And I hope you stayed along for the ride. And that if you submitted a comment or an audio clip, thank you so much. It was a lot of fun to get your input and to respond to it. I don't know if it would be on this epic scale, but I would love to do this type of kind of you know, semi-imagineering ideas show in the future. So I'd love to hear if you enjoyed this or if it was a bit much. Email me, dan at tomorrowsociety.com, Twitter, Tomorrow SOC, Facebook or Instagram at Tomorrow Society. You can also check out my YouTube videos. I've been putting some videos of home movies. The most recent ones are from a trip in 1976 when I was a baby. You can find that at tomorrowsociety.com slash YouTube. Those are super fun, and I'm exploring more and more as I go along. I have some 1989, 1998, and 1976, and there's more to come. So subscribe to the channel if you want to keep up with that. Just wanted to mention the Tomorrow Society podcast is a listener-supported show. So if you would like to help out, you can go to tomorrowsociety.com slash member to find out ways. I do a monthly show called the Tomorrow Society Bulletin that is kind of like this. The shows are not two hours long, but they essentially cover one topic a month. It could be about documentaries on Disney+, Plus, books I've done. It could be about latest news looking back to the past, looking to the future. It's a topic. It's just me talking. If you've enjoyed this, it might be right up your alley. I've also done some bonus shows and extra perks that you would get if you make a small monthly contribution. Wanted to give a shout out to my July new members, Allison Quinn and Aaron Meadow. Both of you, thanks so much for the support. It makes a huge difference in keeping the show going and allowing me to talk about Epcot for hours and hours and hours. 
The Tomorrow Society podcast is hosted, produced, and edited by Dan Heaton. The music was written by Adam Hookey, performed by the Sophisticated Babies. In two weeks, I'll be talking with former Disney Imagineer Rick Rothschild about his work as the show producer on The American Adventure and Soaring Over California. So much more. It was awesome to connect with Rick, and I think that show comes perfectly to follow up what I've talked about on this podcast. Thanks so much for listening to this massive Improving Epcot podcast, and I will talk to you again very soon.